Okay. Uh, first of all, I'd like to introduce my wife and co-author, Marie Simovich. Hello. 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 Hi, Gordon. I hear Hello. you're out there someplace. <laughs> Anyway, um, <laughs> I love it. I know it's a laugh. I know. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, anyway, this presentation is based on our book, A Natural History of the Anzabrego Region. And um, Marie and I are co authors, and it was published by Sunbelt Publications. And um, they publish books pretty much exclusively about the natural and cultural history of Southern California. So if you are interested in those things, you might go to their website and take a look. And I'd also like to say um, the illustrations that you're going to see are illustrations out of the book. And we had two really remarkable people help us with them. One is uh, Dio Linda Montiero, who was a graduate student of my wife's at the University of San Diego. And she, she's doing all the charts and infographics in the book. And then Annie Kowalski, who is our niece um, and has a fine arts degree from University of San Diego, did the line drawings. But she did them when she was a senior in high school. And this is a table of contents. Whoops. Bye. Just to give you an idea um, of what's in the book, it's divided into two parts. The first part is about the physical environment, the geology, um, climate, weather, and geography of the area. And then the second part is the biological environment. And um, people tend to have different visions of the desert. And one, if you look on the left, um, people often think of it as an area that's pretty much devoid of life and not many plants, not many animals and not many people. And uh, there was a, a sign that was an art project that was put up on the um, monument that marks the boundary between Imperial and San Diego counties in Anza Borrego. And it said, this is the desert. There's nothing here, absolutely nothing. And um, we don't really share that vision. <laughs> and I think that the people that really know the desert, first of all, it's a very challenging environment. And a lot of organi organisms have taken a lot of different evolutionary paths to deal with its challenges. And so it's really a very rich and diverse area. And so the desert is a land of extremes, both in temperature and the availability of water. It's an area where evapotranspiration, which is the evaporative power of the sun, exceeds the amount of precipitation that generally falls in a year. The soils tend to lack organic matter, and also they can be high in salinity and alkalinity. And water, it, um, the Enza Borrego averages less than about six inches of rainfall over the last 50 years. In the last five years, it's actually averaged less than four inches. So it's in a period of drought. But on occasions, and especially during the late summer and early fall, when we get monsoonal influences, we can get um, thunderstorm thunder cells that can drop several inches of water in a relatively confined area in just a few hours time. And temperatures vary both daily and seasonally. Because there's very little cloud cover in the desert, first of all, we get a lot of insulation, a lot of sunshine during the day. And then at night, we do not have a sort of insulating cover of clouds. And so a lot of that um, heat is re reflected back into the atmosphere. And so temperatures can drop quite precipitously. And over the course of the year, it is not terribly unusual for us to get snowfall during the winter. So, and, and have, and at our house in Brego Springs, I remember the first year we were there, my parents lived in Oregon and they wanted to come down to get away from the winter. And the first night that they were there, the temperature dropped to 14 degrees. So, and then during the summertime, it's been as hot as 123 degrees at our house. So again, it's an area of extremes. And deserts are also um, sort of typified by convergent evolution, meaning that organism, plants and animals that grow in different areas that are deserts tend to have, tend to often be physically similar. And, um, you know, in the new world, we have cactus, which is probably the plant that people think of most when they think about the North American and South American deserts. Well, cactus don't, don't exist in the old world except for one species that's actually um, a parasite on trees. However, another family 
the U4BACA have radiated into that niche. And so if you think about North America, one of the most um, apparent cactus that we have is the, uh, is the organ pipe cactus in the Southwest. And it has a, a euphorb that looks almost exactly the same called the candle auburn tree in Africa. And other examples are um, several species of fox that grow in, that live in deserts um, are quite similar. That includes the kit, kit fox in North America, the uh, finnick fox in Africa, <clears throat> and the Corsic fox in Mongolia, though that they're in different clades within um, the genus Volpes, they actually have come to resemble each other with um, relatively small body size, long legs, big ears. And also, for instance, Jeroboas and kangaroo rats have a lot of similar characteristics. They're both hoppers, they store fat in their tails, um, they're relatively small size, but they're not very closely related at all. And another example would be the Saharan horned viper and the sidewinder that we have in North America. And they both, both have sort of little flaps that fit over their eyes that keep sand out of it when they're crawling through the sand. And they're both sidewinders. They use that form of locomotion. And we talk about, whoops, we, we talk about climate on both a global scale and talk about how um, variations in the rotation and orbit of the earth influence climate. And we also talk about phenomena that exist on the local scale, such as um, uh, rain shadows that are um, related to local topography. And also phenomena like clouds. Uh, on the left is one of my favorite sort of atmospheric phenomena, which are lenticular clouds, and we tend to get them in the desert. And lenticular clouds are caused by air masses that are moving laterally across the landscape. They um, encounter um, topography like a mountain range, and they're deflected upwards. And of course, as they rise, they're cooled adiabatically. And as they cool, um, the water starts to condense out of them. And because the air continues to move, those areas where uh, water is condensing takes on a lenticular or lens-like form. And what will happen is that will happen at one elevation, and then the air will keep rising now with less water in it. So it, water condenses at a new lower temperature, which is a little bit higher in elevation. And so you tend to get these stacks of lenticular clouds that look like stacks of pancakes. And also, we tend to get thunderstorm clouds. As we showed before, they can drop quite a bit of rain in fairly small areas. And we also talk about atmospheric and oceanic circulation and how that affects formation of deserts. And both those phenomena tend to affect areas on the west coast of continents between about 30 and 40 degrees north and south of the equator. So in that zone, we have some of the deserts of the world. And actually, the, um, in atmospheric circulation, we have Hadley cell, which is the, um, oops, here we go, is this cell of sort of um, vertical circulation that is driven by warming, by warm okay. sea surface temperatures near the equator. So air rises and then goes poleward, and as it cools and loses its moisture, then becomes heavier and drier and sinks. So it encounters us um, and Zabrego and other deserts between about 30 and 40 degrees north and south of the equator. And we also talk about mountain building, which is important regarding our deserts because our deserts are, are rain shadow deserts, meaning that these changes in topography often prevent the, uh, the penetration of moisture both from the north and in our case from the west as well. And we also oh, talk about. We have some. Uh, uh, we have some background noise. Could uh, we be sure to all mute, mute ourselves? There's some background noise. And 
Also in Southern California, we have an expanding crust and the tension in that crust has called block faulting. And so we have this typical, um, what's called basin and range topography in the um, Southwestern United States, which is alternating mountain ranges and valleys. And also here in, oops, can, I'm not sure. So I can look. This is actually a picture of the mouth of Canyon Sonombre. And over here on the right, which is underneath <laughs> all our pictures, it shows uh, a what's called a nonconformity, where we have an area uh, sort of like in this picture, where we actually, it's called a nonconformity because we have newer sediments that are over or excuse me, older sediments that are overlying younger sediments. And so this particular example happens to be one that's in a couple of geology textbooks. So we talk about the formation of the Southern California mountains again because of crustal extension and also because of plutons that were formed um, um, during the during and before the Pleistocene underneath Southern California. One is the Sierra Nevadas, and this is the Southern California uh, batholith that, that underlies the coastal mountains. And the Imperial Sea, between about three and six million years ago, the Gulf of California actually extended northward up till up to about the area um, where Banning is now, even though that's not really an accurate statement because during that time, the west side of the, of the um, San Andreas Fault has moved about 50 miles further north than it was at that time. Anyway, the Imperial Sea actually took in part of the eastern part of what is now Anza Borrego. And um, whoops. There we go. And if, in your, if you are familiar with the Split Mountain area, um, Fish Creek in Anza Borrego, if you go through Split Mountain and go south, once you pass out of the mountain itself, you'll see these, um, these hills of sediment. And they're very yellow in color. And those um, are marine sediments from the Imperial Sea, three to six million years old. And within those sediments, there are layers that are more resistant. You can see these and they're called elephant knees because they stick out. And then also this cap is also made of the same material. And what that material is, is uh, called coquina. And what that is, is compressed oyster and mollusk shells. When during the Pleistocene, sea levels rose and fell as the continental um, ice sheets expanded and retracted. And at, so the water level in the Imperial Sea changed many times during that period. And when water was about 10 meters deep or so, oyster shell reefs would form. And then of course the water level would go up and they would be buried by sediments. And so the reefs would become compressed. And so if you look at them now, look at the coquina, you can actually pick out the individual seashells. And these from, are all from about three to 6 million years ago. And then these are other shells that we find actually in marine sediments themselves. And this is a, a sand dollar on the left and then a scallop on the right. And Lake Kauia, um, Lake Kauia was a freshwater lake that occupied the basin where the Salton Sea is now. And it had several sort of lifespans over the last 400 to 800 years. And the Colorado River, um, before, <laughs> before we built dams and put flood control on it, would have an annual flood every spring when the snow in the Southern Rockies would melt and an enormous amount of material would move down the course of the river. And if, if you think about it, think what's in the Colorado River upstream from where we are. You have these big holes in the ground like the Grand Canyon and Bryce Canyon and others. And all the material that was in those places came down the river. And it's, it's estimated that about 10,000 cubic miles of material came down the Colorado River. And so each year that material would move down during the spring flood. And when the flood ended, it would drop 
And so the next year when the flood came, well, that would no longer be the deepest channel. And so the river would migrate back and forth from east to west. Well, when it was in its westernmost configuration, it impounded behind the river delta of the Colorado River and formed ancient Lake Cahuilla. And like I said, we know that it existed at least three times between 400 and 800 years ago, and probably in deeper time more often than that. And we still have some of the um, remains. And if you look at, this is a view of the east end of the Santa Rosa Mountains, and you're looking at it from the south, and it's quite easy to, be, to pick out the ancient shoreline of Lake Cahuilla. And this took in a, um, quite a bit of the um, eastern side of Anzabrego Desert State Park and, and completely covered what would have been the Salton Sea. It was, uh, the lake itself was about 100 miles north to south and 35 miles wide. And paleontology, Anzabrego is actually one of the things it's known for is the amount of um, fossils that are found from the Miocene and the Pleistocene. And some of them are plants and the left, those are probably California Bay Laurel that are fossilized. And then one of the things I find most fascinating, this picture is the picture of a sandstone overhang in, uh, in Split Mountain. And so you're looking up at it and what this is, is these are the positive impressions of footprints that were made in a muddy puddle 2.4 million years ago. And this is a gompothere, which is ancestral to uh, modern elephants. And you can see it has three toes here in the front. And then if you look at the back of it, you, it unfortunately doesn't show up in this slide, but you can actually see the striations of mud where he stuck his foot into the mud and then pulled it out. And then also over here, uh, before the mud puddle disappeared, um, a, a, a dog, probably something similar in size to a red wolf stepped in it. And then unfortunately further over here to the right, which we can't see, whoop, we can't see or are the, are the feet print of a large cat, probably about the size of a mountain lion. And one of the things that this shows is evidence of migration of animals between North and South America. There's an event or a series of events called uh, GABI, G-A-B-I, which stands for the Great American Biological Interchange. And several different animals and species and families of animals move between North and South America along <clears throat> cent Central America. And so things like giant terror birds, which were nine foot tall birds that were apex predators came from South America into North America. Also giant ground sloths and then glyptodonts, which are large armadillo-like animals. In the South, um, uh, placental carnivores, large mammal carnivores like uh, cats and canids came into South America. And then also horses and, um, and gompotheres, which are elephants. And some of the fossils that we found are, are giant tortoises. This tortoise shell is in the um, museum at the visitor center in, in Brego Springs, and it's a little over a meter long. So this was a turtle that was probably about four feet long, if you can imagine that. And then these are dermal ossicles, which are little pellets of bone that were in the skin of giant ground sloths around their necks. And it's believed that they armored their necks from predators. And then we had, uh, there are several remains of large cats in Anzabrega. We had uh, Smilodon gracilis, which was a saber-toothed cat, but we also had um, the American cheetah-like cat, um, uh, jaguars, and then a ancestral cat that was ancestral to all of those. And then also we have about 200 sites where relatives of modern elephants were found in Anzabrega, which kind of blows my mind. I mean, if you think about it, that the landscape of Anzabrego was once dominated by mammoths and gompotheres. And of course, horses and llamas both evolved in North America and then migrated out. Horses went across the Bering Strait into Asia and eventually Africa, and llamas traveled south into South America during Gabi, and uh, llamas became um, 
high elevation specialists. And so they live native, they live in areas in the Andes, mainly above 7,500 feet. Camels also evolved um, sort of close to the pole in what they call the whole Arctic region. Um, and when the Bering Strait formed, part of that population was confined to Asia and they became uh, Bactrian camels in Mongolia and then also eventually dromedary camels in Africa. The camels that were on the North American side of that splint eventually went um, extinct. And the camels, of course, became arid land specialists. We also had carnivores on the left is uh, the giant short-faced bear, which is probably the largest mammalian predator ever to be in North America. It stood 11 to 12 feet tall, large ones, and weighed over a ton, if you can imagine, a bear that size. And then is a Smilodon or saber-toothed cat on the right. And about eight to 12,000 years ago, a lot of those large animals, the large mammalians, um, went extinct. And that coincides with several different things. It's one was, of course, there was climate change going on. The Pleistocene, the ice ages were, were ending. Um, also, there was uh, the entry of invasive com uh, competitors, and especially such as bison that came into North America about that time. And they were very effective grazers and outcompeted a lot of the, um, the animals that at that time were native North American grazers. And then also the entry of humans into the Americas and the development of Clovis culture. And Clovis culture is typified by the use of very large projectile points. And it's assumed that some of these were probably used on very large animals. And in fact, they have been found in association, association with um, the fossils of animals that were apparently were killed. Um, we also talk about how animals and plants adapt to the desert. And um, we talk about how animals both gain and lose heat. And actually, most of the heat in a warm-blooded animal is generated by the metabolism of the animal. And in a desert, the, the problem is not so much absorbing heat from the exterior as it is the inhibition of dumping off metabolic heat to the environment. If the temperature outside the animal is as warm or warmer than the body temperature of the animal it becomes a problem. And so the most effective way for an animal to do it is through evaporation. And in, in some mammals that's by sweating and some birds it's by uh, what we call gull or flutter, which means they flutter the tissues of their, um, of their mouths and beak and throats and water evaporates from it and they give off heat. Okay. And we talk about water gain and loss in plants. And um, plants absorb um, water through their roots, but also through their vegetation and, and bodies or stem cells. And they lose um, water through evaporation from their leaf surfaces, but also from transpiration uh, linked to photosynthesis. And animals adapt to high temperatures through body morphology. Um, long, thin bodies that have a lot of surface area in, in comparison to volume tend to be more effective at dumping off heat to the environment. And so a lot of the animals that we have in Anzabrego um, tend to be longer and thinner than their close relatives. And this on the right on the, is a desert black-tailed jackrabbit. And next to it is a Arctic hare. And they're both about the same length, about a foot and a half to two feet, but the Arctic hare has twice the body mass of a desert black-tailed jackrabbit. And so if you think about it, because it has bigger body mass, it has a bigger volume to surface ratio. And so it gives off less heat to the environment than the desert black-tailed jackrabbit does. And also locomotion, how animals move. Um, because there's not much organic matter in soil in the desert, it tends to be rather loose. And so hopping becomes a better locomotion option than running. And so a lot of desert animals are hoppers because that way most of the force is directed straight down instead of backwards. And so less soil is displaced and so less energy is wasted in displacing the soil rather than moving the animal. And also sidewinding is a locomotion that is good for loose substrates 
And actually in sidewinding, um, a snake forms two loops and the loop that's actually exerting the force is stationary. And the way sidewinding works is the back loop will put, push the front loop forward. The front loop will then pull the back loop up to it and then repeat that at high speed. And sidewinders um, tend to have keeled scales on their stomachs, meaning that there's a little structure that goes across the scale. It's sort of like having a lug on a tire or like the lugs on your vibram soles, and it tends to grab the soil. And so it gives it a base for this pushing and pulling action. Then another adaptation that we see in um, desert mammals, and this is something that um, bighorn sheep have and also camels, is a carotid reet. And a carotid reet is a sinus within the skull. Okay, And there are two sets of blood vessels that, that intermingle in it. And one is arterial blood that's flowing to the brain, and the other is venous blood that's coming back from the nose where it has been cooled. And so you have arterial blood passing through colder um, uh, venous blood. And so what it allows the animal to do is to have a, a lower temperature in its brain than it has in the rest of its body. And then we have some typical desert animals. The uh, kangaroo rat is a good example. It's small in size, so it has a large surface to volume ratio. Um, it lives in burrows underground. It stores its food underground, and it actually absorbs some of the moisture that the kangaroo rat exhales. And so when it eats the food, it actually regains some of that moisture. Um, also, it is nocturnal. It's out at night, and it hops. And the sidewinder, another typical animal, um, it has some of the things we've mentioned before. It's a sidewinder. Um, it has um, little covers that cover its eyes, so it can go through sand. Um, and also, it's mainly active during the night. Desert pinkhorn sheep, we've talked about it as carotid reet. Um, it's a very mobile animal, which is, and also it has extremely keen senses, which allows it to detect and elude predators. Avoiders and adapters. Um, in general, this applies to plants, but also some animals as well. So there are basically two strategies for survival in of desert plants. And one is to uh, basically not to exist <laughs> when, when conditions are very, um, are very warm and trying. And so, you know, every year or not every year, but in many years in Ansprega, we get these great wildflower blooms. And so, well, you know, where are those beautiful annual flowers for the rest of the year? And because they're mainly there during the spring, during um, during April and March and uh, the latter part of February. And the answer is, is that, well, they're still there, but they're just existing as seeds in the soil. So they only come up briefly when conditions are very favorable. And then you have adapters like the creosote bush um, that are there all the time. And so they have a suite of adaptations that allow them to be, um, to exist in harsh climate. And some of them are, um, they can hold their leaves you know, instead of holding the leaf at a 90 degree angle to the direction of the sun, their leaves can tilt. Okay, many plants in the desert have gray or fuzzy leaves that reflect light. And also plants um, like the creosote have thick waxy cuticles that um, limit the amount of water loss through transpiration and thick leaves that are succulent, which save water, but also reduce, reduce surface area. And then having many thin leaves that reduce the boundary area around the plant. Other things are having succulent stems that are large um, in diameters. Again, that volume to surface area ratio. And plants like the Ocotillo that have photosynthetic strips. So the plant doesn't have leaves all the time. It only has leaves when conditions are most favorable and there's a lot of water in the soil. Otherwise, they conduct photosynthesis through those strips. And then also, stems that expand like an accordion. And you can see this in barrel cactus in the desert. And so it allows them to um, retain larger volumes of water in their stems. And then water potential and hydraulic redistribution. And what this is, is that 
water, plants actually, and I, it, this is a passive process, meaning that the plants don't actually expend energy to move things around. Water moves through plants because of um, uh, capillary action in the small veins in the plant and then differences in water potential. And water will tend to flow from areas of low water potential to areas of high water potential, meaning that areas that have less water will actually attract water from other areas and it will move through the tissues of the plants through capillary action. And so generally, if you have humidity potential, meaning the air, air is very dry in the desert, water will go up from the roots, up into the plant, and then out into the atmosphere. When you have a storm event and there's lots of water in the soil um, near the surface of the ground, water potential and capillary action will move water down deeper into the roots. And so then later on, when um, the water will move back up to the plant and back up to the soil surface when there's less water available there. Succulents and phreatophytes. Succulents are plants that actually store water in their tissues. And cactus are a good um, example of this. Um, also agave are succulents. And um, oh, ocotillo to a lesser degree. There are also phreatophytes. And uh, the word phreatophyte comes from the Greek word for a well, phreas. And they are plants that are able to bring water up from great depths. Um, in some cases, over 100 feet. And they do this, and this sounds counterintuitive, by having their growth period during the hottest period of the year. And that's because that's when the uh, amount of transpiration in the plant is maximized. And so that difference in water potential causes water to come up from great depths. And the plant's roots are always in water because it's, it's in groundwater, okay? It's below where the water table is. And so the roots are always there and what brings the water up is actually the increase in temperature during the summer. And so that allows the plant to have more water available during that time and to photosynthesize more. We also talk about trophic pyramids and food webs. And this is how food as energy moves through plant and animal communities. Uh, trophic pyramid, if you think about it, um, there are plants, okay? There are animals that eat plants. Then there are animals that eat animals that eat plants and so forth. And each step as you go up is a step in the trophic pyramid. And, and because of the loss of energy between steps, the amount of biomass in each successive step of a trophic pyramid is only about 10% of the one before. So if you think about it, if you have a plant um, that has, and we'll say that, that that'll represent 100% of the biomass, then you have a mouse that eats a plant, well, that's about 10% of that biomass. A snake that eats the mouse is about 1%, and the hawk that catches the snake and eats it is about 0.1%. So what that tells us is that the top of the line predators are generally few in number and range over very large areas. And as you move up the trophic pyramid, um, animals become less common. But if you actually look at who eats who and who consumes who and who scavenges on who, the relationship isn't quite as nice and linear as a pyramid, but in, in fact sort of becomes a web. If you look at something, and unfortunately the coyote is off here to the right, but the coyote eats plants, coyote eats um, reptiles, the coyote eats, coyote eats small mammals. And then in turn, the coyote is um, eventually is scavenged by vultures and also decomposed by fungi and bacteria. And so it's, it's a fairly complex relationship if you start looking at the relationship of how energy actually flows between different species in an ecosystem. Pollination relationships are um, what we call mutualistic relationships, meaning that there are benefits to both species in it. And probably one of the best known is the relationships between 
uh, hummingbirds and red tube flowers. And the, the hummingbird gets a source of nutrition that isn't available to some of its competitors. And the tube flower gets an animal that very efficiently pollinates it. And so it allows it to reproduce. Uh, another example that's not maybe quite as elegant as this is the relationship of bats to um, cacti and um, other plants that are, adapt that are pollinated by bats. And there are basically two groups of bats that do this. And an example of one is the Mexican long-tongued bat. And they're very well adapted to, to harvesting pollen and nectar from these big white cup-shaped flowers that bloom at night on large cactus and also on yucca and some agave. And they're able to hover so they can actually hover by a flower and then use their long prehensile tongue to pick up pollen and nectar. Kind of the second set are what we refer to as the face planters, meaning they can't hover and they don't have a long tongue. So in order to access nectar and pollen, they actually fly into the flower and plant their face in it. And what's interesting is, of course, the, the pollination specialist, the Mexican long-tailed or long-tongued bat, is more efficient in actual, at actually harvesting and eating pollen and nectar. But the face planters, like the pallid bat, are more effective at pollinating because they get pollen all over them when they do that. And of course, they take that on to the next plant. So it's a good example of actually the adaption, adoption of these, of these animals in mutualistic relationships are basically beneficial to each species itself and not necessarily beneficial to both animals and plants in the relationship. And predator-prey relationships. Um, you know, if you're a prey animal and you've evolved to become poisonous to predators, it doesn't really help you very much if the pre predator doesn't know you're poisonous until he eats you, okay? And so aposomatic coloration, and that comes from the Greek word for, for sign, apo and somatic, which means body, a body sign, is a way that animals that have evolved to be toxic tell potential predators. And so they tend to be very bright in color. And if you, this is um, a monarch butterfly and this is a monarch butterfly um, uh, caterpillar. And they're both very brightly colored and have very bold markings. And they don't get eaten very often because they are poisonous. On the right, and you can see that one wing, is a monarch butterfly, okay? That is not poisonous, but has evolved to look very much like um, uh, I'm sorry, this is a viceroy butterfly, and it has evolved to look like a monarch butterfly. Okay, and so that's called Batesian mimicry. And it's where an animal that isn't poison evo isn't poisonous evolves to look like one that is. And where both viceroy butterflies and monarch butterflies coexist. Viceroy butterflies don't get eaten very often. They survive much better than wh when they're just in areas where there are no monarch butterflies. Oops. One other thing there, or another set of adaptations that help desert species are enhanced senses. Now, how many people, you know, when you go out and drive at night in the desert and you'll be driving along the road and you'll look and you'll see green eye reflection next to the road. And what you're looking at is um, some animals, and especially those that live in low light situations, um, have a membrane called a tapetum lucidum that is behind their retina. And it's actually a reflective surface. And so when, I, when light enters the light, eye, it goes through the pupil to the retina, and then it goes to the tapetum lucidum, and it's reflected back through. So animals that have one get two doses of light, both coming in and going out. And so it enhances their night vision. And what you see when you see green eye flash is, um, is actually the light that's being reflected back from the retina, back through the retina. And so unfortunately, 
people don't have these, well, except for vampires, of course, but, um, and so we don't see very well in low light situations, but a lot of um, deep ocean animals do have them. Another um, adaptation that enhances senses, and this is the sense of hearing, are auditory bullae. And this is the, the skull of a kangaroo rat. And they have these big chambers in their skull that act as, as sort of like echo chambers and allow them to hear sounds at very low frequencies. And one of the advantages that that is, is um, you know, one of the nighttime predators, and of course kangaroo rats are mainly active at night, are owls. And owls tend to have double branched feathers, which lessens the amount of sound that they produce. And so when an owl comes down and dives on an animal, it and flares just before it catches, those, the sound that the feathers make is not audible to most animals. Well, the kangaroo rat can actually hear those low frequency sounds. And so when an owl comes down to flare on a kangaroo rat, he hears it. And so the, it can take some sort of evasive action like hopping really high, really fast to escape the owl. And, oops. Um, other adaptations, most of you have probably heard about tarantula hawks. And tarantula hawks are large wasps, uh, black bodies and orange wings that uh, parasitize uh, tarantulas, which are the large black hairy spiders there um, that we often see in the desert. And they parasitize them by stinging them and the tarantulas are paralyzed. And then the tarantula hawk drags it down into a, um, a subterranean chamber that it has already prepared and it lays a single egg on the abdomen of the tarantula. And as the egg changes into a larvae, it will slowly consume the paralyzed tarantula. Kind of a little scary, um, um, but um, it allows the tarantula hawk to survive and reproduce. Um, another set of, um, of kind of a mutualistic relationships that are, aren't quite so gruesome um, revol revolve around creosote galls. Now, if you've been to the desert and you've seen creosote plant, which is the most common plant in our desert, um, you'll often see that they are these little um, balls that form on the twigs and branches and stems and flowers and fruit of creosote. And actually what they are, are the homes of, um, of the larva of, of insects that are um, called creosote gall midges. And creosote gall midges, there, there are 15 species that we know of that parasitize creosote. And they all have very similar lifestyles that they, when a female um, creosote gall midge emerges from its gall, it harvests the spores of a fungus that grows inside the gall, which it has been eating during the time that it was developing as a larva. And so it comes out, it mates, and then it finds a creosote bush. And the, the different species of creosote midge galls parasitize different parts of this creosote bush, or they do it at different times of year. And so we know of about 15 species. Now, each species of creosote um, gall midge has a species of fungus that it has an obligate relationship with. And it will, when it, after it's mated and it goes to the appropriate part of a creosote bush and puts an egg in it with its ovipositor, it has a little organ on one of its leg called um, a mycangia. And the mycangia carries the spores of, the, of that particular fungus. And so it inoculates the place where the egg has been laid with, that, with the fungus. And the fungus is what actually causes the formation of the creosote gall. And kind of to make things even more interesting, they found that there are actually 17 different species of wasps and sawflies that parasitize the larvae that are growing inside the creosote um, gall midge galls. And so they're able, able to detect the location of the larva within the gall, and then with their ovipositors, they deposit an egg inside the larva. 
So if you think about that, that little relationship you're looking at when you look at a creosote gall, there are there are 32 species of insects potentially involved, 15 species of fungus, and of course, one green plant, which is the creosote bush. So it just kind of amazes me sometimes um, how complex these different relationships can be. Okay, we also talk about habitats. And you know, uh, again, one of those misconceptions about the desert is it's, it's one thing, you know, that it's so, you know, sandy dunes and or cactus on a hillside. And actually, it's many different habitats. You know, in the higher elevations in An Anzabrega, we have pinyon juniper forests. We have desert chaparral on the high slopes. And then below that, rocky slopes that have plants um, like yucca and agave. And then we have oases where plants like um, Washingtonian palms and alders grow. And then as you get down to the lower areas, we have um, cacti. Acatillo, agave. And finally, we have at the lowest elevations, um, flats and, um, and playas where there are frequently very challenging conditions of soil uh, chemistry where you, the soil is very um, saline or very alkaline. And so you have a set of plants that grow there that are adapted to those conditions like iodine bush that don't really grow in other places. And so these are some of the habitats. This is uh, Brego Palm Canyon, the first palm grove. This is Coyote Canyon. And these are sort of uh, riparian associations where there's surface water. And then creosote scrub, which is one of the most widely distributed plant types in North America. And then uh, a playa or dried lake. This is Clark Lake. And then also we talked a little bit about human prehistory and how people entered the uh, North America. And, you know, this is a, a hypothesis that's changed <laughs> radically in the last few years. I was taught in school that, you know, when uh, humans came into North America, they came via um, the Bering Strait and crossed it probably during the ice ages when the water level was low and followed an ice-free corridor down uh, North America on the east side of the Rockies and then spread out from there. Um, well, the only problem with that, that hypothesis is that not much of the actual archeological evidence supports it. And um, the, actually the oldest archeological site in the new world isn't up here in Alaska, it's actually down here in Monte Verde in Chile, Chile which may be as old as 16,000 years, okay? The oldest archeological sites in California are on the Channel Islands. So um, an alternative hypothesis come up that's called the um, Kelp Highway or Maritime Route. And what that hypothesis is, is that, uh, is that Asians that were living in probably Siberia and the um, eastern part, of, or excuse me, the western part of Beringia developed a maritime um, lifestyle where they were harvesting uh, kelp, fish, invertebrates along, along the shoreline of the ocean. And if you think about it, that's where a lot of the richest resources are for human beings. And so they simply over time, followed that, what they called the Kelp Highway around the edges of Northern Asia and then North America and followed it down into North America and then South America. And then by the time they got down to South America, um, they at some point turned inland and then developed a different culture that was based on hunting large animals, which were very numerous at that time in South and North America. And so over time, actually, um, again, this is the oldest archaeological site in, um, in the New World, in Chile. The oldest, um, you know, we talked earlier about um, uh, Clovis technology, which were large um, projectile points that are related to hunting big animals. Well, the oldest um, Clovis sites are in northern South America 
And then the oldest North American sites are in Mexico and Texas. And so that suggests that that culture developed in Northern South America and then moved into North America. And so again, it's sort of a, a change from what some of us learned when we were <laughs> back during the Pleistocene when we were in school. And the evidence of early prehistory in Anza Borrego. Um, there are, if you, especially out in the Eastern Anza Borrego, there are areas where you have archeological remains that are called um, either sleeping circles or swept circles. And you'll see these cleared areas um, that are oftentimes surrounded by rocks about the size of bowling balls. And those are believed to be some of the older sites in Anza Borrego. Now that's kind of a tough thing to say because it's very rare to find any organic matter associated with these sites that can actually be dated. But anyway, um, Malcolm Rogers, who was an early pioneer in the uh, archeology span of San Diego, said that there are sites like this that are very similar to it. They're located um, close to the coast and he called them San Diego sites. And some of the San Diego sites did have organic remains with them that could be dated. And so they came back at about eight to 9,000 years. And he believed that, that was evidence of the first human beings that were in far Southern California. One of the things that distinguishes these sites is that the projectile points that are found associated with them tend to be larger. They're probably the, um, the points of darts that were thrown by a device called an addle addle, which preceded the development of the bow and arrow. And an addle addle is a and you can see this, um, an example on the left is uh, basically it's an extension of the forearm and it has a notch in it. And so the base of a dart can be fit in that notch and then it can be flung forward and it, and it um, allows you to throw a dart much faster and farther than you could just with your arm. But the darts that are associated with that, the dart tips, the projectile points are much larger than the projectile points that you find associated with bows and arrows. And um, also one thing that distinguishes the early sites that, we, that you see from the later ones is there, there are things that they don't have. Number one, they don't have, they're not associated with rock milling features. Also, you don't find any pottery shards in them. And also you don't find um, obsidian chipping wastes. And those are all very common in more recent sites. And it's not hard to find evidence of late prehistoric period Native Americans in Anza Borrego. Again, they processed a lot of vegetable food and they did that by using mortero and morteros and basins and rock rubs, sort of rock milling features. And those are frequently um, accommodated or associated with early, um, excuse me, with late prehistoric sites. And then also ubiquitously in those sites, you will find bro broken pottery, you will find ceramics, and you don't find those in the older sites. And these are some uh, features of more recent Native Americans. Um, this is a, on the left is a hunting blind above Yaki Pass. And it's a place where bighorn sheep commonly pass from Pinyon Ridge to the north into Yaki Ridge to the south. And it's believed that Native American hunters would conceal themselves in these areas, and then of course, um, strike when the animals were passing close by. And this is a rock shelter in the far south end of the park. And this has been, um, the earliest dating of this site goes back to about a little over 4,000 years ago. And it was believed to be continuously occupied from that time until the early historic period. And so it, it act, acts as a good reference in terms of trying to date other sites within the park. And in its very lowest levels, you find adlatl dart points. And then as you go up, smaller projectile points become more common, probably associated with bows and arrows. And then also in about the last 18 inches, which corresponds to about a thousand years, you start finding uh, ceramic pottery. So that gives us um, an idea of when um, those technologies were innovated in the Anza Borrego area. And then on the left is um, a Wonderstone core. And Wonderstone is a material very much like chert that's found in the east end of the Santa Rosa Mountains. And it's 
it, it flakes really well and makes exceptional stone tools. And also it tends to have um, a variety of colors in it. And so it was traded widely by Native Americans who was traded out to Arizona and northward um, up into the Great Basin as, as was obsidian from Obsidian Bluff um, at the Salton Sea. And so that lets us know that there were extended trading networks where these materials that have very local origins started and were traded through these networks to other people and other groups. And also another um, evidence of Native Americans that we see frequently are pictograph and petroglyphs. Pictographs are, um, are essentially rock paintings that are made by using colored dyes. And then petroglyphs are images that are actually chipped into rock surfaces. Okay, well, what's there to see in the future for Anzabrego? Um, I think one of the things that we need to be very concerned about is climate change, is that um, the trend that we've seen lately is for um, less rainfall and for rainfall that falls at different times of year. Typically, for most of the last couple centuries, water has fallen during the winter and spring in, in the Anzabrego area. Um, what we found is there's been kind of a shift going on and we're getting somewhat more rain during the late summer and early fall during the monsoonal period and then less during the winter. Well, this is not necessarily a good thing for plants that are adapted to take advantage of available rainfall. If it comes at a different time of year, um, it's sort of out of sync with the cues that they normally take that initiate things like germination and flowering. And also, um, there are relationships between plants. And for instance, a lot of the annual flowers that bloom during the spring are pollinated by solitary bees, which are non-social bees that um, live subterraneously. And the same cues that cue the plants up um, also cue the emergence of the solitary bees, except that they're more focused on temperature and the plants are more focused on the availability of water. Well, what we found is that these signals are decoupling. And so the emergence of the bees is now starting to become <coughs> out of sync with the germination of the flowers. And as plant distributions change, also animal distributions do as well. And presumably as the climate gets drier and warmer, plants will migrate far either up in elevation or farther to the north. And we know that this happened during the Pleistocene when we had several different climatic changes. Well, during the Pleistocene, we didn't have Los Angeles, we didn't have the Bay Area, we didn't have San Diego blocking potential migration paths. So we have to think about what does this mean now that plants and animals may not be able to migrate to areas that will be more suited, um, they may be better suited towards. And so we get to the fact that, you know, over time, the parks, and especially Anzabrego as an example, has faced many different challenges. Um, you know, there, there have been power lines suggested to go through the park. There have been water conveyance canals. And so far, every time one of those threats has come up, the public has been the protectors of the park, okay? The politicians really don't what care what me as a park employee say about something like uh, one of these potentially damaging projects going to the park, but they care a whole lot about what their voters think. And so I've seen several times now as different issues have come up that have threatened the parks that, um, that the public has stood up and defended them. And so right now we have with climate change perhaps one of the biggest challenges that we're facing now or, or have faced in, in memory. So again, we count on organizations like the Sierra Club and the people that make up those organizations to be the parks protectors. So anyway, I'd like to thank you for listening. Um, and if there are questions, um, we can take some of those. Yes, thank you. Um, we have several questions. Well, we have a few questions in the chat, and you can still put them in there if you like. Or um, 
um, you can just put your hand up and we can go um, by that route too. Let's, I'll start with the chat and then um, see what we have first here. Let's see. Um, okay. Oh yeah, and, and don't forget to look at the chat too because of um, both the Diamond Valley Lake and the tree uh, survey. Um, okay, let's start right here. So um, there was a question about what would be some suggested field guides um, specific to the California deserts that you might you suggest? I, I'm sorry, I, I couldn't hear. What came after the specific? <laughs> oh, oh, a field guides. Field oh, guides, field. Um, you know, various. Yeah. Well, for Anza Borrego, as you, as, as my wife and I actually, and uh, another uh, member of the faculty at USD wrote a series of field guides, specifically pocket field, pocket field guides published by Waterford Press um, for um, what it, uh, Shrubs and trees, wildflowers, cactus, and then animals. Okay. There's three. There's a set of three. And so those are field guides, and then of they're pocket field guides. They're, they're the little foldable ones you can put in your pocket. Did they okay. And so that's through Waterford. How do we right. find those? Um, well, they are sold at the um, um, the Anza Borrego Park store in Brego Springs and the Anza Brego Foundation, if you go to their website, you can buy publications through them. And actually that's good because then the profits from their sale go to the foundation and the foundation uh, uses the money that they get to help buy in holdings for Anza Brego, which is a- Did you say that about the book too? Well, and also um, our book, um, the profits from the book all go to the Anza Brego Foundation and also the royalties do. So if you buy a copy of the book, um, all the profits from the book will go to the foundation. And the <clears throat> over time, the foundation has existed for over 50 years now. And during that time, they've bought up over 53,000 acres that have been added to Anza Brego Desert State Park. And you know, when the park was originally formed, there were thousands of acres of private inholdings within the boundaries of the park. And so this has been, in terms of being able to cohesively manage the park, it's very important that these areas get added back into the park. And we can um, we can buy the book online through the Anza Borrego Foundation website, and or uh, visit the park and buy it at the right. one of their stores. And, Is that and, correct? And, okay. and the field guides are available there too. Okay. Okay. Great. Yeah, there was comment how, on how pretty the illustrations are, um, and then um, I had a few questions. But you mentioned how the bighorn can um, survive in heat. What about in the sun, the really hot summers? As you were saying, one hundred and twenty. What did you say? One hundred and twenty-three degrees or something? You yes, experienced yeah. out there. Well, the did they have more mortalities during that time, or? Well, it's the most stressful, but you know, one of the things that bighorn sheep can do is they can um, drink about 20% of their body weight at a sitting. And so they use a tremendous amount of, of water. Um, and so, which is another reason to be concerned with climate change. Um, but they, I'll, I'll say this from having participated in many bighorn sheep counts is Bighorn sheep aren't really vigorous, vigorously active during the day, during the high heat, like any other reasonable animal, they seek out shade. And um, though they can, um, in terms of their being chased by a predator flea, um, they don't do a lot of that during the summertime. Those water, those water sources need to be maintained. And so also the, the water sources that they do use are maintained. And so um, the park has put out uh, drinkers that collect runoff water and make it available as surface water for animals and also maintain some of the springs that are in the park to make sure that they still have available surface water. Oh, good, good. 
Um, another question, um, did you get much of the December 2021 rain? Is there any hope for a desert bloom this winter? Um, unfortunately, not much. Um, what, what was the total rain? I don't know. It, um, it, it wasn't a particularly good year. I mean, usually the, the best indication of a good flower bloom is a lot of rainfall in December, and we didn't get a whole lot this year. Okay. So that's what the next question was. What is the what are the best months for the desert to get rain to, to produce a super bloom? Well, it would be December mainly, and then and then usually the rain that you get after that will um, prolong the bloom. Oh, okay. Another question is mesquite one of the plants that exhibits root growth during the hottest times of the summer. Well, I don't know about growth, but they, um, in terms of transporting water from, from depths in the soil up, yes, they do. And um, mesquite um, are sort of the phreatophyte, though they, they, don't, they don't access water as deeply as some of the others like Palo Verdes and desert ironwoods. But they do oh. hmm. Yeah, they did bring it up during the summer. Um, there was a, an interesting comment that uh, David said that he suffers brain fade on hot days. <laughs> Does anyone make a carotid reap that they could get installed? <laughs> not, not that I know of. I know. <laughs> yes. Um, is there any um, other evidence connecting the human migration from Chile to North America? There was the big gap in between the two to show that could be the route. Um, there, you know, the, uh, the archaeological record in general has more gaps than it does evidence. And so um, there have been, there has been do work done in South America where they're trying to find evidence of um, early um, Clovis technology and things like Clovis. Um, but again, you know, with archaeology, as with a lot of other sciences, um, you know, in order to tell the story, you have to speculate a little bit. And so you have to kind of draw lines between different data points and um, at this point, not a whole lot more <laughs> than what I was aware of. Yeah. So they're kind of competing um, migration theories at this point, huh? Yes. To the one with the, okay. Yeah. Um, and then you spoke about bison being an invasive species. Where did they invade from? They invaded from um, Asia and, um, this was, oh, I believe about 12,000, 15,000 years ago. And so um, they migrate just like other. I mean, you could talk about horses invading Asia, really. Um, and so animals move around. They do. Mm -hmm. um, and Shay put the, the link on the, um, on the chat for the shopping for the um, Anza Borrego Foundation for maps and guides. Thank you, Shay. Um, and then we have, uh, Carrie said years ago, friends and I observed a lone bighorn sheep standing way below in the backlands, the badlands, um, by himself. And then they said, uh, and so, um, is it normal for a bighorn sheep to be in the badlands? Well, they're, they're highly mobile animals. They don't really hang out there much, though there is, you know, probably at the Palm Oasis, Oasis um, in the Badlands, they may, and especially bighorn males will cover, will go between different mountain ranges to seek mates. So, I mean, it's certainly not a common thing. But, but they may just be moving to someplace else. Yeah, it was probably in route to someplace uh. else. Just didn't wrap. 
Yeah, and then I see that um, Luce has had her hand up for a while. Luce, do you have a question? Um, you need to unmute if you're if you'd like to ask a question, Luce. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, maybe, maybe no, I don't have, have a question. Have a question. No. Okay, there you go. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, I've gotten uh, several comments saying how uh, it's seen uh, that it's been fascinating and a really nice presentation. So I really appreciate that. I hope um, everybody uh, goes shopping now for some books and guides mm -hmm. to help out the Anza Brago Foundation and um, and have a good collection. <laughs> so um, I. Are there, are there any other questions here? Yeah, I don't see, yeah, I don't see any hands. Okay, well, we certainly do appreciate that. That was a really great presentation. Thank you, Mike. Well, thank you. I just, fun. I just wanted to say that coming in next year, we'll have another book on desert safety that'll be published. And, um, and I just wanted oh. to say that our, our book just recently um, was given an award by the California Commonwealth Club that gives the California Book Awards, and we were awarded a gold medal for contribution for publishing. And in San Diego. Wow. And, and also we Thank were a fun so much. So anyway. So wow, that's great. Yeah. It is. We loved it. We lived yeah, it. Yeah, thank there. you. We can't wait to. We can't wait. And thank you so much okay well thank you all thank you all for doing what you do for the environment thank Please. you very much <laughs> thanks everybody yeah, thank good you night. so much okay okay good night good night Bye.